Okay, go ahead and hit play. And we're live. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. And you may notice that there's someone else down in the corner tonight. Uh, my hi. wife isn't feeling very good, so Melody has stepped in. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> um, so she's going to be keeping track of the questions tonight and we will see how that goes. Uh, if you are new to this, we do it live every Tuesday. If you're watching this recorded, then down in the description down below, I have all of the questions marked out with timestamps so you can jump down to them. Um, if you're watching this live, go ahead and throw your questions in the chat and Melody will catch as many of them as we can. Uh, if you do throw up a super chat tonight, uh, you're not going to get a mom joke, but we do have plenty of dad jokes. So uh, stay tuned for that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, for notes of things coming up, uh, for those of you who don't know, we, at the beginning of this live, we always do a uh, heads up for what's happening in the Wood by Right world. Um, so if you want to watch that and don't want to watch the rest, then there you go. Um, number one, next weekend, wait, next weekend? A week from this weekend, <laughs> I'm going to be down in Atlanta at WorkbenchCon. So if you're going to be there, uh, let me know. I was trying to work out a, a get-together, but I don't think it's going to work out. The schedule's pretty well packed for that. Um, next up, March 26th is the MWTCA meet here in Loves Park, Illinois. It's actually a couple miles away from me, so I'm going to be at that one. Uh, let's see, uh, June 14th through the 17th, I'm going to be in Green Bay, Wisconsin for the national MWTCA meet. Uh, Handworks is going to be in September uh, the 1st and the 2nd. And if you're not, if you're going to go to anything this year, Handworks is the one. Handworks is the big event for hand tool woodworking. It's an entire town devoted to it for two days. Um, everyone who is anyone will be there and uh, it, it's, it's well worth it. And, and I, I mean that everyone in the hand tool world is there. So um, it's going to be fun. Um, so those are notes coming up. Tonight we're going to talk about spoke shaves. Um, what are they? How do they work? How do you sharpen them? How do you use them? There are lots of questions about it and mostly that's because there are many, many different types and shapes and styles and functions of spoke shaves. Uh, they come in all kinds of different fun things. Um, here is a Miller Falls uh, number one uh, cigar spoke shave, Miller Falls number two. Uh, this one's kind of cool because I can pull this out and I can change it from a round body to a flat body. Uh, the traditional, the not traditional, well, yeah, traditional, the Stanley 151. This is the, the spoke shave that most of them get built off of and there are many 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 different types and styles of the one of the uh, the uh, of the 151 there we are this is the Stanley 53 uh, which is very similar in style but the adjustment knobs are different uh, then there are all sorts of other weirdos uh, aluminum body wooden body and I've got a bunch more these are just the the most common ones out there um, and I got these ones because they're there's a lots of different uh, things in that um, basically, the biggest difference in spoke shaves is flat bottom versus round bottom. Um, flat bottom has a flat sole. Um, just like a plane, it is perfectly flat and uh, rides nice and clean. A round bottom, on the other hand, has a rounded sole. Uh, this allows you to get into tighter, more um, concave um, surfaces. You will also find concave irons. Um, though they are not very common, um, and I'll be getting to those. Um, but generally, you're going to be looking at either getting a flat or a round. Um, and most of the time, I'm going to say, get the flat bottom. 90% of the work you're going to do is a flat bottom. Um, it is easier to learn, it's easier to work. You set it down and it just, it goes. You don't think about it, it's just taking curls. Um, and flat bottoms are easy, they're simple, and they're, they're relatively affordable. Um, this one, the Stanley one, uh, 151, uh, there are remakes of this by Kuntz and uh, well, everyone. If they make cast body hand planes, they probably make a remake of these. And the nice thing about it is you can get the cheapest one on the market and it will work perfectly fine. Um, yeah, every now and then you're going to find one that has something odd about it, but it usually just takes five minutes of the file um, and you've got it up working because it's, it's just a slab of metal. There doesn't have to be anything finely tuned in this. There's two different adjusters that move it up and down and it works. Um, they don't have to be perfectly flat. They don't have to be perfectly clean. They don't even have to have a perfect bed. Most of them are painted. Um, so getting a cheap one is really easy. Um, there, you can get the, the, the ones on uh, Amazon for like, what, 25, 30 bucks, and uh, they work really well. Um, I just threw myself off track. <laughs> I'm going to be getting to sharpening in a moment, too. Um, so the... Let me go back to the, the big difference between flat bottom and round bottom. Um, even with a, a flat bottom, you can still do large 
concave surfaces. Uh, let me bring this one up. So here I've got this, let me see if I can back that up a little bit more. It is relatively big radius, but I can still come in with this and I might need to budge it out just a little more. And the nice thing with a spoke shave is you don't need a tight mount mouth on it because you're almost always going with the grain. Now I can do the exact same thing on this with the rounded body. And I can get really nice, clean, smooth curls with that. But the rounded body, I can actually get even more. I'm gonna do, uh, let's pick a spot down here. So bring this down to here, where my finger's at. There we go, focus. We were gonna have Melody running the camera tonight, but uh, then Sarah backed out. Oop, grain's going the other direction. So with this, I can actually come in here and I can make a relatively tight, concave shape. Going against the grain. And I can even make it a little tighter with this one. This is the uh, Miller Falls number one. This one I can really, really make it tight. And I can get that basically a dimple in there. Um, the, the thing is, with a flat bottom, I can get down to probably around a four to five inch radius. And if I'm getting any smaller than that, I'm probably needing something that's rounded. However, at that size, I could just as easily grab rasps and files and shape it out with that. And I kind of go back and forth at that point. Um, I know Paul Sellers particularly, he advocates that you really only need the flat bottom. Um, and I am in fairly close agreement to that because um, it's very, very rare where the round bottom really makes sense. However, uh, that being said, if I'm grabbing one or the other, I think more often I'm gonna be grabbing the round bottom. The round bottom is harder to learn. It takes more skill because um, it just, it, it's harder to balance right. Um, if, if I have it rotated back too far, it's not gonna get anything. If I have it rotated too, forward too far, it's not gonna get anything. And right here, I'm just barely touching. And if I rotate it just a little bit farther, now I can get a really heavy curl. And it just gives me that little bit of function that I like that micro adjustment, just by the little rotation there. And that pleases me. Do I need it? No. And a lot of times what people will do with a regular spoke shave, uh, with a flat bottom, is they'll actually make one side cut deeper than the other side. And if one side cuts deeper than the other side, I can get a, a fine cut over here. And then I can come over here, actually this is the other way around. This is my fine cut. And I can move over to this one and I can get a really heavy cut. Um, the other thing you're gonna notice is that a lot of times here I'm pulling towards me. And here I'm pushing away from me. And why am I doing that? And the reason is it's much easier to just flip the, this around than it is to flip the whole board around. And so it all comes down to ease of use. Dad. What's that? We got a super chat for oh, a kid super joke. Chat. Alan Smith. <laughs> kid joke. Goodness. You want a kid joke? Do you have a joke, Melody? Uh, yeah. You have a kid joke? What, what's your kid joke? <clears throat> what is a mathematician's favorite dessert? Pie. Ah, uh, yeah, it's pie. <laughs> it's classic. <laughs> <laughs> you asked for it, Alan. <laughs> um, yeah, so Sarah's not here. Sorry. Now, she has a, a bit of a sore throat, so uh, she is hanging out today. Actually, I think she's going to take a shower and go to sleep, so more on her. Um, push, you, push versus pull. Uh, there is no one way to do it. There is no best way. And I, I, I get told this all the time. Of, oh, you should never push a spoke shave. You should always pull it because of ergonom ergonomics. My foot. It's the same movement either way. Uh, it, it just comes down to which direction is the grain going there. And it's much easier to rotate this around and just go the other direction than it is to take this out of a clamp and move it around. Now, yes, if I'm using a shave horse, um, it is really easy to then pull this out, flip around, put it back in. Um, but I still think that flipping this around is easier than flipping the whole workpiece around. Um, so, yeah, which direction do you use it? It just depends on which direction is the grain going when you're working on it. Uh, 
Ah, next up, the the next question that often comes up is the sharpening of it, and there are two main types of irons. Um, number one, you've got. Here, you should take these apart. Well, here, let me do this so you can see. Uh, number one, we've got the the standard iron. This one came out of my uh, my fifty three, um, and so it's just a small piece of metal, just like a um, a plain iron. Um, and then I've got this one over here, which is a wooden body that I made years ago. Um, actually, I have a couple of videos on making uh, these ones. These ones have tangs. And with these, you take your plane adjustment mallet, and you tap the tangs out, and you've got that thing. And uh, these are a little bit harder to sharpen, but not too much. And then there's these other weird ones, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Miller Falls number one. And with this, I loosen these two up. Just loosen them a little bit. You don't have to actually take the screw out. And then this whole blade rotates back and it lifts out. And this thing is weirdo. Um, yeah, very, very weirdo. And each of these gets sharpened ever so slightly differently, but they're all basically the same. The, the big problem is that they're all small, which makes them hard to hold, and hard to hold often means um, hard to sharpen, especially like with the, the Miller Falls uh, number two. Um, this one is a simple plain iron, but it's a lot shorter. Like this one's, what, almost two inches from blade to back, whereas this is only like three quarter inch from the tip of the blade to the back of the iron here. So I'm gonna grab my sharpening station. And for those of you who've been putting questions, we will get to them. Uh, some of them I'm sure I've already answered or will answer. I'm going to go through the majority of this for another five, six minutes, and then we'll start jumping into answers. So if you have those, throw them in the chat, and Melody will uh, catalog them for us. So for sharpening, I'm going to show you each of these. Uh, my favorite method for these is to grab a uh, um, vice grips. Uh, now, unfortunately, I don't know where my big ones went, and I was going to grab them before. I just want to see if they went over here. No, they didn't. I've got a big pair that make it very, very easy for this one. Um, oh, sorry. Vice grips. I've got a big pair that make it very, very easy for this. And what I can do is put it on here, and I'll clamp this on the back, and I'm going to use the head to actually slide on the plate. Now, these ones are actually too small for this iron. This I can fit. Oh, oh I can fit it up in here. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Um, nope. Right there. All right, cool. So this one I can actually fit in between the groove. Hold it on there. There we go. And now it's locked at that, and this is actually the, the bevel point. So I'll put my fingers on here and go back and forth on it. So just like a plain iron, except for in this case, I've got a lot more surface on here. Now this one is actually pretty close to fully sharp. So I'm just going to hit it on my finest plate here. And I'm just going to go back and forth. Ooh. Make sure I've got a burr. Unclamp that. One quick swipe on here. And then, whoop, grab the rag. Always wipe off the plate immediately. Keeps it nice and clean. And then I'm going to set it on this one. And for this, I'm just doing a little bit of polishing, making that burr disappear. A couple strokes one side, a couple strokes the other side. Flip it back over, and that one's good. Um, let's move on to this one. Now, with these, I almost never touch the bevel side. Let me move in a little bit more here. Come closer. Um, I almost never touch the bevel side. If I do, I'm actually going to take the plate out, and I'll rest it over the side of something. And the nice thing about it is it actually will rest on here, and I can hold it on there. Here, let me do this. I can hold it on here. And I just lock it in place and just do that. Hey, nice little burr there. But I almost never touch that side. Um, I Basically, unless I have something I need to grind out, I'm only touching the flat side. And so for that, I'm just going to put that back in here. And this goes in here. Now, generally, these actually have a slight radius to them. They're lower in the middle than they are. So if you do it flat, um, you're going to be doing a lot more in the middle. And so I'll often start with the pressure on this side, and I will slowly rock it from one side to the other. So I'm going to start over here. And as I get to the other side of the plate over here, I'm putting pressure on the back side. And as I bring it back, now my pressure is over here. And so that shift of pressure from one side to the other, 
just does that. And it doesn't take much at all, um, unless you have a ton of work on this. That was actually really nice. Um, then we can come into the strop, do the same thing again. This one's a little bit harder. I can lift it up like this and just hand strop it because I didn't do much on the side. We don't need to hit it that much. I'm just getting that burr to fall off. One more. And there we go. So that one's good to go. Uh, the last one is the weird one. Um, now all the other ones, like, like this little one, I'm still going to use the same vice grips to hold it in place. But how in the world do you sharpen this thing? And this is the Miller Falls um, number one. And so it's a, a bent piece of metal, but the one edge has a bevel. And so for this one, you can touch them in the inside, but generally I don't touch the inside other than with a strop. Uh, the outside is the only the edge that I'm going to put it on. And so for this, I'm going to set it down on here, and my finger is going to come inside the concave. Let me bring this over here so you can see it a little better. Focus! There we go. I'm going to bring it over here, and my fingers are going to be inside the concave, actually pushing it down when we find that bevel. And I keep it flat on there. My thumbs are on the back top here, and I'm going to go slowly, just making sure I'm keeping it flat, just hitting that bevel, not letting it slide back and forth. And it feels weird for me to do it at this angle because usually I'm going to do it this way, um, but that you can't see anything. So <laughs> flipping it around this way. And I'm just going to do that. And once I get up to feeling it, and actually I'm feeling it rocking. Yeah, don't do that. It feels odd to do it at this angle. I'm making sure my pressure is on the inside, pushing down on that bevel. Fingers tucked inside, my, almost my fingernails um, pushing on that bevel. Ooh. And normally I'd be going a good bit faster, but because this is an odd angle, here, let me flip back to this camera. I'll do it this way. This is the way I feel good at it. And like that. Got a nice clean surface. And just a hair more on this one. This one is actually a little dull. I haven't sharpened this one in a little while here. Probably should have taken it back to the coarser plates, but... That'll do. Then we can move on to strop. And we just want to clean off burr, strop. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Nice and sharp, catching the fingernails, or the uh, finger ridges. So then we can put it back together. And here, let me make sure you go back to this one. For this one, You've got, this is a rounded surface here, and then in here there is a small flat space that comes into this. And this is where the mouth of the iron should fit in. So I have the iron here. I'm going to put that on top without slicing my finger up and rotate it back into place. And I want to rotate it back and I want to leave this mouth wide open because I can always close up the mouth, but it is harder to um, open it back up. And I'll show you that in a moment. So with this one, just going to tighten these two down a little bit. And I want to tighten them down equally because they actually shift the iron side to side. And that one's ready to start setting up. Uh, let's see, for this one, this one goes in um, beveled down. Most of these with a solid plate are beveled down. Whereas these ones are beveled up. Um, so yes, they do come in low angle versions. <laughs> um, and with this one, there's an adjustment with the lever on the back for kind of opening and closing the mouth. Oops, that's too much. And I don't want this to stick out because again, I can always pound the iron forward, just like a wooden body plane, but I can't back it up. So I'm lightly feeling it with my fingertip and seeing where it's at. That's where I want that one. And then for the, the wooden body here, that one I'm just going to push in with my thumbs, get it close. And this one we can adjust a little bit more that way. This one's probably one of the easiest ones to regularly adjust because I can pound these back and then I can pound that forward and I get it right to where I want it. Um, 
With the 51, you actually have these knobs back here that allow you to push one side and then the other. And this is probably the easiest one to adjust. I can wiggle them back and forth. Uh, with this one, I actually open and close the mouth with this screw. And that opening and closing the mouth gives me my different types of cuts. But most of the time, I'm going to leave it retracted. And then I can come in with this and just tap until I feel it right where I want it to be. And then I can do a little bit of adjustment, open and close the mouth. Um, with this one, I leave it wide open. And I can come back with this and tap it around and slowly close it up. Um, but of course, I'm going to, I, I kind of have an idea for what they're supposed to feel like. Where did I put that board? There it is. Um, and so I'm going to play with them and see that feel what I want. And some people like to have one side heavy. Some people like to have one side light. Oh, that one's actually pretty close. Let me grab here, uh, this one. So on this, uh, a lot of these um, traditional wooden body ones, it's very, very common to have one side heavy and one side low because they're, they're a long surface. And also with these, I can adjust their cutting. Here I'm not doing anything and then I'll slowly roll it back. As I roll it back, I'll feel that I'm just scratching the surface right there. Or I can really roll it back and take a heavy cut. Or I can come back in and scratch it up. So a lot of times what I'm doing, if I want a rounded surface on here, let me start on this side, I'm going to take my heavy cuts and I'm going to turn it into a, a 45 degree chamfer. And then I'm going to come through and I'm going to knock off those corners from the 45 degree. And then I'm going to use my light scratch to come back in and slowly remove all of those facets. I get a nice, clean, smooth transition. Um, another problem you're often going to have, let me see if I can get this one to do it, is, it'll, uh, especially if I'm going 90 degrees to the plate, so if this is straight across 90 degrees, there's no twist in it, um, I'll get some chatter. Of course, this one's newly sharpened, so I'm probably not going to. Let's see if I can get what it does. Uh, that one does. No, that one's not going uh, to. This one might. No, that one's good and sharp too. If they're good and sharp, you're generally not going to be getting a lot of chatter. Um, I bet I can make this one make chatter. Where are we? Oop, there's the mouth. No, even that one, now that it's nicely sharpened, it's not going to chatter. So if you do get chatter with 90 degrees, what you do is rotate it, put it 45 degrees, and you come back over those chatter points, and you can eliminate them. And then you rotate it 45 degrees the other way, and you come back over those chatter points again, and you eliminate those ones. Um, so if you're getting that chatter, it's usually because you're straight across, and if you just rotate it 45 degrees one way or the other, you can slowly eliminate the chatter. Um, let me talk about it. The concave iron. Um, this is the only one that I own. I've only used them a few times, and the couple times I've used them, I hate them. Uh, the idea is you've got that rounded surface. It should make it so much easier to come in and actually uh, do it. Now, this one isn't set up, um, so it's not going to actually cut any, but it should theoretically give you a rounded surface. The problem is the concave shape on this is almost never going to match the concave shape you have, and so you're still going to be making facets that you still have to come back and clean up. Yeah, you're probably going to make a few less of them, uh, but the couple times where that's been beneficial are incredibly rare. And 90% of the time, actually, never have I ever been wanting a concave um, spoke shape. Um, there are people who love them, but even when making all round dowels, I generally just prefer to use a straight iron. Um, that's my personal. Um, okay, let's move on to questions because I know there's going to be a whole bunch of them, and I'm probably going to be, that'll throw me into other tangents. So, what's the first one we got, Mel? Uh. First one is from Alex Adams. Um, maybe what styles of spoke shave handles are good for large, medium, and Sarah size hands? <laughs> uh, well, that's the interesting thing about spoke shaves is you don't hold the spoke shave. You don't grip the spoke shave. They're not meant for your handle. You have 
thumb and index finger that come in and hold it on either side. You just pinch it like that, and that's why the rest of the fingers are out here just for stabilization. So the size, oh, this one's gonna chatter. Yeah, there we go, I got some chatter on it. If I lift it up a little bit, you can get it kind of bouncing. So if I turn it a little ways, I can come back through and eliminate the chatter. But I'm just holding it here. This is where all my control is. I'm rolling it with my thumb and index finger, and the fingers come out here just to do a little bit of balance out here. They add a little bit of support, give my hand more to grab onto. Oop, come on. Yeah, nice heavy cut. And then I can roll it back a little ways and clean it up. Cool, what's next? Um, what you got, Mel? Sorry. Uh, I can't read. I'm That's fine. Um, okay, I'm just going to spell it out since I'm terrible at we all, we all know you're good. Give it your best shot and then read the question. Sad sure? That was terrible. <laughs> okay. Good enough. What's the question? Uh, typical and difference between a curved handle and a straight handle. I have one of each. Um, I think we all went through the setup on there. And I think when you're saying curve handle versus straight handle, you're talking like uh, this one has these, these curves on it. And again, it's the same thing. Thumb up here. Index finger over here, that's what's controlling it. Fingers on this are just for the stabilization. So whether it be curved or straight, um, really doesn't make any difference. It's just thumb on the back, index finger on the front, that's your control. And then the rest of the fingers are just there for a little bit of stabilization. Or, yeah. What's next? Uh, next question is from Oop, Nano Mechanist. Um, his question is: Would there be any point in the low angle spoke shave? Um, I talked about that a little bit. Yeah, a lot of them are. Well, okay, they are all low angle by by attribute. Um, <clears throat> even these that are beveled down, um, their angle is. 35 degrees and so that's why you usually are sharpening these around 20 maybe 25 degrees but you usually don't take them all the way to 30 um, <clears throat> because the 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 um, iron is at a lower angle than a standard plane um, but you do have a lot of these ones with the the tangs um, these because the sole is the flat of the iron this is a bevel up and so you can get these that are you know 20 degree uh, which is incredibly low because the iron is flat. Um, so yeah, um, they're all a low angle cut. Um, yeah, even like uh, the Miller Falls number one, um, the, the iron is, um, the bevel on the iron is actually the sole that it rides on. Uh, so they are all low angle. <laughs> What's next? Okay. Next one is from Alex Adams. Pros and cons of pushing versus pulling, and when it is appropriate for each of those directions. Uh, it's the exact same thing. It's the grain of the wood. Um, when, when the grain is running towards you, you pull it. When the grain is running away from you, you push it. And uh, it's, it's really just that. There is no body mechanic benefit one to the other. Um, you will hear a lot of people saying that pulling towards you is a better body mechanic than pushing away from you. Um, and the idea being is that you usually have more strength pulling something towards you than you do pushing something away from you, um, just the, the muscle mass. However, in control and something like this, you're not going to be anywhere near your maximum push or pull pressure. Um, and so that is actually, you know, it's, it's superfluous. Um, it's the exact same movement, you're just doing this or you're doing this. Um, so, which direction is the grain going? What's next? Okay. Uh, from Nano Mechanist, just thought of a question I forgot. I'm making a coffee table out of hard maple waterfall style. Two inches thick lumber all around. Can I get away with no cross support? Um, it depends on you. I mean, when, you when you're talking about cross support on any particular table, 
what is its intended use? Um, and how are you going to make that waterfall joint? If you're just gluing them together, they will hold really well. That glue joint is relatively strong, but over time it is going to weaken. Um, it works much better if you have splines. Um, dowels, even there at that point, will help out. Um, floating tenons. Um, however, ask yourself, what is going to happen to that coffee table? If you have kids in the house and they're rambunctious and they're like running around the living room, <laughs> no, it's not going to last. <laughs> Uh, if you are putting it in a grandma's house and uh, not much is going to be happening to it, then yeah, no problem. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, you know, how much, um, how much do you want to warrant it happening to this table? Um, if if your other legs, like if you have a waterfall on one side and you have legs on the other then you can actually put something into those legs to make those legs more strong and have all the lateral force be put into those legs rather than in the waterfall side. Um, but if you're doing a waterfall on both sides, um, I, I wouldn't put it in my house without some sort of cross bracing, um, but I would probably have no problem putting it in my parents' house um, because it's not going to see crazy amounts of whacking on it. As long as the joints are good, you should be okay. What's next? It is from Moon Wolf Woodworking. Are you or doing you are you or do you have blades for the number 80 scraper plane? Um <laughs> So, I've got this one um in my iron. Let's see if I can get it. Out. I don't know if I can right now cuz so I cranked it down a bit. Uh, this one is actually blue, and you can see the, the top half of my logo on there. Uh, this is a prototype from DMF Toolworks uh, from three years ago. Um, and he was looking at making them, and he just hasn't done it yet. Um, so if you talk to him, he might start making them. Um, I know Hawk Irons used to make them. However, with the, uh, I don't think they've made them in a while. Um, so I actually don't know of a new place to get new Stanley 80 scraper blades. Um, however, um, they tend to be a little bit thicker than a, a regular card scraper, but a regular card scraper will work perfectly fine. Um, so if you have an old saw plate that you can cut apart and stick in there, that will work perfectly. Um, the, it, it just has a little bit uh, more chatter if you're pushing hard or doing heavy work with it. Um, so the thicker blade will allow you to do a little bit heavier um, work. Um, Used, there's, there's lots of places for it. Um, so go to handtoolfinder.com, go down the list of online sellers, and about half of them will have those in stock. Um, but for new, I don't know of anyone who's making them right now. If you knew, let me know. What's next? Uh, Somi Ota, I, I have no idea how to pronounce that. I'm sorry. Uh, Paul Sellers released a video on the Stanley 151 and says you only need a flat bottom and round spoke shaves are some something one would rarely use. Agree or disagree? For the most part, yeah. Um, <laughs> you only need a quarter inch chisel. Everything else in the, uh, in the shop is superfluous. You can flatten boards with this. You can chop down trees with this. You can do joinery with this. Uh, you could do everything with a quarter inch chisel. It's just going to take more time. Um, and so it really kind of comes down to how much time do you want to put into it. However, when it comes to flat bottom versus round bottom, 99% um, of the time, the flat bottom is going to work. There is a small range where the flat bottom won't work and it's a bit too big for a file and rasp. And even with that, a file and rasp will still do it relatively quickly. It's amazing how fast you can chop through stuff with a file and rasp. Um, so it is an incredibly slim, rare chance where I would really need a round bottom. Um, however, for me, I actually really like using the round bottom. I find it to be very comfortable and enjoyable, and so that's why I tend to use it. Um, however, it is, it's a lot harder to learn. Um, you can learn a flat bottom very, very quickly. And honestly, um, this is one of the first tools I tell you to give to kids. Um, a flat bottom spoke shave, 
um, anyone, if it's set up, anyone can do curls. There's enough of a bed on here that you can make curls and have a ton of fun. And you hand this to kids and let them whittle away on a stick and they will be entranced for life. Um, it's one of those things that is incredibly enjoyable. So yeah, do you need it? No. Um, is it nice to have? Maybe. Um, and with, like me, you eventually end up collecting spoke shaves because they tend to follow you home. And there are so many different styles and shapes and types. And it's like, ooh, I'd like to try that one. Ooh, I'd like to try that one. And so every one of them is a little different. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with them completely. Um, I just, um, I try not to say things dogmatically because then there's some odd case that tends to bite me in the backside. So, no, I, yes. <laughs> What's next? Next one is from VDog55. Did I waste my time yes. pawning my flat spoke shave saw more flat? <laughs> yes, yeah, you wasted your time on that. Um, <laughs> flattening planes. These ones. 90% of the time, when someone flattens a plane, it does not need to be done. Um, there are very few cases where the plane needs to be perfectly flat. It needs to be coplanar at the mouth, the heel, and the toe, uh, but everything else in between, as long as it's not sticking out, it, it doesn't really make that big a difference. Um, and when it comes to a spoke shave, uh, they don't need to be. Actually, let me see if I can show you this one. Uh, this one, here. I'll show you the glint on this one. So here I've got it really well polished where it's been rubbing the wood a lot. And so there's actually a bit of a concave, a concave here. Over here you've got some really deep heavy scratches uh, where there's also a uh, concavity over here. It's relatively flat here, relatively flat here and across there. Um, but mine is an absolute mess on the sole and works perfectly fine. You will never notice the difference if it's out of flat by a couple hundredths. Um, yeah, that's one you don't need to worry about. And that's why I say, you know, go get the cheap one. Do not spend the money and buy a really high-end one unless you like the feeling of high-end brass feeling. Um, buy the cheap one off of Amazon. It will work just as well. Um, it, as long as it looks like the 51 and has these two knobs in the back, um, it, it, it'll, it'll treat you well. Um, yeah, I know there's always some weird edge case where someone got one and there's some problem with it. Um, but most of the time at that point, you, you send it back in and they'll send you another one. It works perfectly fine then. What's next? Okay, from Alex Adams. Hey, Alex. Metal body, metal versus wood body. Is it's the same difference as metal and wood body planes? Pretty much. Um, <laughs> um, I, I don't like... Or, I like, but I generally end up using wooden uh, metal bodies, even with the planes and other things like that. And if you like wooden body planes, you will probably like wooden body spoke shaves. It's the exact same thing, with the caveat that the wooden body spoke shave wears out much, 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 much faster than wooden body plane. Um, and the reason being is you have a very small wear surface in front of the iron. And so this one, I've got a space from here to here and it's worn out into almost a dish. Um, and so, yeah, well, this one's really dull. <laughs> this one's really dull. <laughs> um, and this wears out because it's a small thing. It rubs on there. And so you'll see a lot where they've actually nailed in or screwed in a small brass plate in front um, to give you more wear resistance on the front edge. Um, but they will wear out very, very quickly if there isn't a, um, a wear surface in front of the iron. Um, they, they don't last um, quite as long. So... Yeah, in general, it's just, how do they make you feel? There's no big difference one to the other. What's next? Okay, from Moon Wolf. Hey, what Destiny. What do you think of rockalert.com no, number 151 bundle on spoke shaves that they are round, no wait, hold on. Round on bundle of those, bleh, I'm sorry. I'm you got gonna, it, you're fine. What do you think of the rockler.com number 151 bundle on the spoke shaves? They are 
round and flat bottom. Yep, good ones. Um, again, cheap is perfectly fine. Um, the, go get the Amazon Basics. They'll work great. Um, you don't really need round and flat. Get yourself a flat one. It'll do 90% of your work for you. Um, and then at some point you'll be like, maybe I do want to try out the round. Um, just understand, when you jump to round, it's going to drive you crazy. They are incredibly difficult to control, and you'll be like, why isn't this working, or why am I taking off such a heavy shaving, until you figure out the tiny, tiny bit of movement that's needed. Uh, it's really just a tiny bit of rotation in this. It'll be like the difference from here to here. That's, that's heavy cut to really deep cut. And being able to control that over a curved surface takes a lot of skill and practice, and it's like playing a piano. Yeah, you can make it work on your first day. You can hit that key. Um, but if you want a song, it's going to take you a little bit. So, patience. But yeah, um, it's a great set. Go and get it. So is Amazon Basic or anything else like that. What's next? Uh, from Gary Johnson. Question, what is James's recommendation for a good affordable spoke shave? Uh, I think we already covered that one a couple times. Go get the cheapest one you can. <laughs> as long as they, they look like the 151, it's, yeah, it's one of those tools where, like this and the number 80, they have been copied so many times, and they're all identical, and there's really no way to mess them up. Um, okay, yes, there are ways to mess them up, but they're so resilient to being messed up that it's not worth buying the high-quality one. You're not going to get one that actually does much more. It'll make you feel better, but... It'll work just the same. What's next? From Cosman, anyone here lucky enough to own a Woodjoy spoke shave? Woodjoy, I have never used that one. <laughs> yeah, there are there are a lot of them out there because um, it, it's such an easy one to to duplicate that there uh, every company has has made one. No, I've never used one from Woodjoy. What's next? Um, uh, from Alex Adams, what is the most comfortable way to hold a spoke shave blade when sharpening or horning? Yeah, the uh, vice grips. We talked about that earlier. Um, if, if they're small and just a simple plate, Put them in a vice grip, use the, the head of the vice grip as your honing guide, and it just makes it so much easier to hold on. It gives you a bigger three-point surface to, to, to sharpen them with. Um, I, I rarely do those freehand because some of them, especially like the Miller Falls number two, that iron is so small, doing it freehand is almost impossible. It can be done, and I've done it. Um, it's just, it's not as much fun. Um, I usually end up using my nail as a guide. Um, just like I'd be using with a vice grip, and it, the vice grip wears out far less than my nail does. So, yeah. Is that another super chat? Yep. Dead so. gamut. Here, I've got one. So uh, here we go. Um, you know, there's a bunch of trees in your yard, Melody. Yeah. There's a bunch of trees in our yard. Yeah. I wouldn't trust them. They're pretty shady. <laughs> That's a pretty good one. Did Dad Gamut ask a question? I don't think uh, I no, can see it just the super chat. Right. What's uh, next then? C of Cornelations. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Uh, I'm getting a lot of chatter with when using a curved spoke, sole spike shape. Any tips? Yeah, um, it, I, you know, I talked about this a little earlier, making sure if you're 90 degrees off, yeah, this one, I'm getting a lot of chat around there. You can almost hear it. Um, and so the way you fix that is if you keep going at 90 degrees and you keep on that, it kind of, the chatter kind of compounds and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And so the way you fix that is you just rotate it at 45 degrees and now it'll cut through. But if you still had the same issue, the same thing was causing the initial chatter, it's still going to cause the initial chatter here. And with a round bottom, not only do you have the problem of the blade being dull or taking too heavy of a shaving, 
Um, but you also have chatter with it rotating very quickly forward and backward. And so you're actually getting these ba ba from the rotation. Um, and so usually that just means hold it a little bit tighter, um, especially with a round bottom. You need to spend a lot more time um, controlling it. That tiny bit of rotation is the difference between just scratching it and then coming in and hogging off. Okay, this one's really fine, so I'm not going to be able to get it to really hog off. <laughs> Let me do it with this one. So this one I can come in and I can just scratch it, get a very, very fine cut, or I can really come in and get a heavy shaving. Um, and that, that's, just, that, that's just a couple degrees of rotation. Um, and so it's very, very easy for this to just rotate back and forth very, very quickly. And that will also cause chatter with a round bottom. Um, but first and foremost, make sure it's sharp. It's got to be deadly sharp. Um, then change angle to the board um, and make sure your, your control is stiff enough so you're not letting it rotate. What's next? Uh, from Humpman6, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Are you properly caffeinated for this? <laughs> I don't need caffeine for the nights. Well, you had your tea before coming down, didn't you? Yeah, but it was a night tea. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I get very active. That's one thing about me and my brother is we are very active near our bedtime, apparently. I'm I, not sure why. Yeah, I don't generally have caffeine after like 1 o'clock. Um, I used to not have a problem with it. I used to drink crazy amounts of caffeine and, and not have any problem with it. Now it, it causes me issues. So, yeah, I don't know now. <laughs> so, no, I'm not properly ca proper, prop, prop. <laughs> properly. I'm not caffeinated. <laughs> don't need to be. What's next? Uh, from Humpman6 again, are you getting snowed on yet in Illinois? Yes, we had snow last weekend. <laughs> yeah, we're not. We don't have any right now. Ours isn't supposed to start until this morning or next tomorrow morning, and we're supposed to be right on the edge of rain and snow. So we're going to be getting freezing rain, slush, hail, and that type of junk. Yes, we probably will yeah. not be getting any snow. What's the super chat? What did Kenny say? I can't read it. We recently got a Stanley number 67 spoke shave. It has the fence. Have you ever had a situation where the fence would be helpful? No. <laughs> um, most of the time when planes have fences, um, <clears throat> straight planes. So if you put a fence on a regular bench plane um, or on this, it's kind of like training wheels. Um, it, it helps you try to get 90 degrees to the side. Um, but once you've been doing it for a while, it's one of those things where you just, you, your body just knows what 90 degrees is. And I can, I can joint a board and put a square on it and it's like, it's right. Just because that's what my body knows. Um, but until you get to that point, yeah, a fence may be useful. Um, the problem with it on a spoke shave is that it locks you in to being 90 degrees to the board. You can't rotate it one way or the other. And so if you start getting chatter, um, you, you can't get out of that chatter very easily. And you start getting this compounding chatter. Um, but very rarely am I ever going to use a spoke shave to joint anything. Um, so that's not, not something I'd really mess with. Um, the, the main reason I ever use a fence is if I'm doing some sort of profile, a groove um, or a molding or something like that where I need to set in in the board from a specific distance. Um, so having a fence on the outside keeps it from moving out any farther. Um, and so that's the, the, the big time. So for a spoke shave, no. Um, though you may be getting, I, I'm trying to remember the 67. I don't remember the 67. Um, because like scratch stocks and things like that have that. And I'm trying to remember if that was the one that, because there was one spoke shave that's also a scratch stock. I don't remember if it was, what was the number on this one? Uh, it's not numbered. This is the Stanley knockoff. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I've never come across the point where I'd like to use a fence on a spoke shave. What's next? Uh, from uh, Dr. King in Hunch. I, I'm so sorry. I cannot pronounce that. <laughs> How is the coffee, how's the growing coffee addiction going? Wonderful. <laughs> I barely have any effects from coffee in the morning, but that's just because I naturally wake up anyway. <laughs> yeah, we uh, actually, for my birthday, just got a new French press, a, a larger size that would do um, two cups worth. 
So I've been having fun with that. Um, yeah, I like coffee. I've always liked coffee. Just I'm glad I can finally have it in the house. <laughs> Sarah's happy because I occasionally make her hot chocolates. Of course, I haven't done that in a while. I should probably do that again soon. What's next? Okay, from Dennis Miko. Uh, are spoke shaves for green wood or dry wood? Uh, whatever you want. Um, spoke shaves work very well in any of them. Um, usually, draw knives um, are, are historically a very, very common thing for um, for dry wood. Though they can be, uh, excuse me, for wet wood. Though they can be used in dry wood. Uh, they're basically a spoke shave without a mouth, and that allows more control. Um, and so you can draw them to you, thus the name, or you can push them. Pushing just takes a little more control. Um, but they are far more common for green woodworking, whereas spoke shaves, because they have the mouth um, and they don't dive in, uh, spoke shaves aren't for taking off a lot of material. And so if you're not taking off a lot of material, it can be done dry or wet. Whereas with a draw knife, you're taking off a lot of material, um, and that's much easier done wet than dry. When you're dry, you get splinters and the thing chips apart. When you're wet, it tends to be a little more forgiving and sliding around. Um, so for smoke shave, you can do it either or. Um, though in some cases with wet wood, if it's really wet, you're going to get them clogging up much more, and you'll have to be careful of rust be getting the moisture um, directly on the tool. Whereas with a draw knife, it's really easy to clean them off. That's not a problem with this. It's a little more difficult to clean them off as you take it apart, but uh, not that much. What's next? Okay, uh, next is from Huntman Six. Uh, what smell? What's red that smells like blue paint? <laughs> red paint. <laughs> 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 All paints kind of smell the same, as I'm being honest. Especially spray paint, goodness. It's a very strong smell. <laughs> What's next? Okay, from Humpman6 again. What's your coffee of choice? I've been loving the tangent pea berry with a very light roast. My favorite coffee, uh... I mainly like just get in some espresso, making it into a latte. Pretty typical for me. Yeah, it so. depends on what we're getting. I mean, if it's if it's a decaf, it's just about whatever. I mean, as long as it's a decent bean, usually a, a medium to dark roast for a decaf. Um, if if I'm making it in the espresso, it's a medium to dark roast. Um, if I'm making it as a pour over, I really like a floral, naturally processed, very light roast. Um, particularly something like from Ethiopia, um, high grown. I, I like that um, wild flavor. That there's a lot of there's a lot going on um, for a pour over. I don't like that standard dark coffee flavor. Um, I want something that's got a lot of sourness and interesting things to play with. But uh, yeah, different things for different people. What's next? Mm. How many more questions do we have, Mel? A uh, bunch. Bunch? All right, we'll see how many we can get to. What's next, then? Okay. If we don't get to your question, I'm sorry. Um, throw a uh, super chat up, and we will hit them. If, if you're putting in questions right now, um, don't worry about Mel. You don't put any more in there, because okay. we've got more than we need. Uh, Warren Man, off topic, what are the best weights for different mullets? Mullets? Did I pronounce that correct? Different Ma uh, M A L L E. Mallets. Mallets. That's what I meant to say. Um, it depends. I mean, if it's a joinery mallet, you're moving something. Um, this is probably about a little over a pound. I like that. Um, when I'm putting my holdfasts in, I have these. Um, these split faces that have a wooden face on it. These are about two pounds. Um, my um, carving mallets are a little bit less. They're probably about three quarter of a pound. Um, something like that, and it kind of varies. Um, my fro mallet is like four pounds, um, so different mallets, different sizes, different weights. <laughs> What's next? Okay. From Mark D. Maker, how much wood 
could a woodcarver carve if a woodcarver could carve wood? Depends on how much wood he has. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I like that. What's next? Okay. From Stan O'Neill, I was recently given a bunch of old tools. I came across a Stanley 68. I thought it was a scraper, but I found out that it was a rabbit spoke shape. Any experience with one of those? 68, 68. I don't have my phone tonight, otherwise I'd look. Actually, I think it's over here. The 68. Um, let me see what we've got. <laughs> S T A N L E Y sixty eight spoke shave. Come on, show me images. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that weirdo. Um, yeah, honestly, I have no idea why you would want one of those. I, mean, I, would, I guess if you're a carriage maker. There's probably a few instances where you'd want that, but carriage makers use really weird tools. Um, but I can't for the life of me think of why I'd want that. Um, carriage makers do a lot of curved joinery. Um, so they'll do curved um, uh, tongue and groove and panel construction. Um, and so in that case, you might want it. Um, so I guess if you're making a curved rabbit, that would be the place where that would shine. But I've never done that. And in that case, I'd probably just carve it. <laughs> What's next, Mel? Okay. Uh, from Alex Adams. This one's a bit of a joke. If it's your tube, would it make it a YouTube? <laughs> yeah, it would. <laughs> What's next? Okay. Uh, from Bruce Fo Foster, when would you need a curved bottom spoke shave? Uh, we talked about that one already, so let's jump on the next one. Okay. From Danny Capaccio, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Uh, how can I tell if it's technique or a poorly honed blade caused chatter? Um, if it's sharp, if it's dull, it's probably the blade. However, how do you test dull? Um, yeah, there really is no good way for me to describe it over the, the camera. Um, if it shaves every hair it touches the first time, it's sharp. Um, if it misses a few hairs, it will probably work. If it's not shaving hairs, it's not sharp. Um, and so that's usually the, 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 the cleanest way I can, the cleanest way, yeah, the cleanest way. Um, if you're working with a round bottom, you're going to have a lot of other problems. If it's a flat bottom and it's chattering, it's probably the iron. 95% chance it's the iron. Um, but if it is, skew it to a different direction and see if that gets rid of it. Um, if it does, great. If it doesn't, sharpen it. What's next? Okay. Uh, we're almost done. Uh, Tom, Timothy, uh, uh, Timothy, we're just going to go with that. I'm sorry, I'm terrible at names. You're fine. Mullen, uh, Melody, how much furniture have you destroyed? Like, less than you think. All I remember is, like, somewhat destroying one. And that was our original couch in the basement. That was, like, and it was somewhat destroyed. Well, I've got some embarrassing ones from you that you probably won't remember. I only remember that one. <laughs> oh, no, there were some fun ones. <laughs> oh, goodness. It must have yeah, there was that, uh, the place in Pennsylvania upstairs. You destroyed the wood floor. <laughs> that's not furniture. That's house property. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there's too much. We've been very, very picky about the furniture we bring in the house. It's all pretty durable stuff. Um, Arthur, Arthur is the one. He chews. He has chewed up, I don't know how many chairs. <laughs> um, he has gnawed apart the the the, the bunk bed. 
Um, he is, he's the destroyer of furniture. He likes to chew things way too much. All right, like one more question. What do we got? Uh, Make it a good one. Um, I'm just going to go with the next one on the list. Cool. What uh, is it? Kenny, uh, Kenny, Kenny uh, and Janet Horn? No. Yeah. Uh, what? No. Kenny and Horn? I'm not Kenny sure. Kenny and Janet Horn. Yeah. I'm not sure if they're pronouncing. Uh, I recently got a number six, a uh, Stanley number 67. It has a fence, but I have you, have you ever seen a situation where a fence would be necessary? Yeah, we actually just talked about that one. Why don't you pick one more? Okay. Oh, the 67, that one. Yeah, no, I, I've never had a chance where I'd need a, a fence. Uh, Martian Chandler, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, uh, is it worth replacing the Stanley blade with a hawk blade? Not for a spoke shave. Um, <laughs> yeah, it will last longer between sharpenings, um, but for how, I mean, unless you're using it all the time, if it is your go-to tool that you are grabbing regularly, um, then yeah, it might be worth it. Um, but honestly, not that much. It, it's one of those tools where you end up using it more than it's sharpenable. Um, or you sharpen it so infrequently that it's not that big a deal. Um, but if you are sharpening it a lot, then yeah, it might be worth getting a better one. But that's kind of a, a personal thing. Uh, I, I, I probably wouldn't have upgraded any of my plain irons other than my smoother, um, just because I don't use them that often. So it's not amazing difference, but sometimes. So um, on that note, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, if I didn't get to your question, uh, send me an email or a message, and I'll try and get back to as many of them as we can. Um, I had a lot of fun with this one. Spoke shades are always a, an interesting topic. Um, I was going to say something else, but I don't remember what it is. If you're going to be at uh, um, Workbench Con, looking forward to seeing you. Oh, I think it's next week. We have a special treat. We're bringing in um, Jeff from Reed Plains because he's got a fun announcement. So we're actually going to be doing a, a live with him. So stay tuned. Um, that one's going to be kind of cool. So looking forward to it. Uh, I think they'll do it. So until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. You can hit the button then. Mm.